So next in our tour of classic ideas in finance is the mean variance frontier and the roll theorem. This one actually takes very little algebra. Let's start with our basic uh, pricing equation for an excess return. Zero equals expected discounted excess return. Break that guy up again by the definition of covariance. We've done that one before. And now break up covariance into the product of standard deviations and the correlation coefficient. Next step, bring the expected returns onto the left-hand side. Bring the other stuff onto the right-hand uh, right side with the zeros. And you get the ratio of expected return to standard deviation of return equals negative uh, standard deviation of m over mean of discount factor times the correlation coefficient between the discount factor and the excess return. Now, correlation coefficients have to be less than 1. Therefore, this ratio of mean to standard deviation can't be any bigger than the ratio of the variance of the discount factor to the mean of the discount factor. And using the standard continuous time approximation, the, the standard deviation of the discount factor is risk aversion times the standard deviation of consumption growth. That's it for algebra. Now let's look at what this means. First of all, this quantity, ratio of mean to standard deviation of excess returns, we use that all over the place. It's called the Sharp Ratio, after Bill Sharp who invented it. And it's a nice measure of security performance because it's immune to leverage. If you, the, the ratio of mean to standard deviation of, a, of a, the same security leveraged up twice is, of course, the same. So you, you can make mean returns look as big as you want by leveraging them up, but you can't change the Sharp Ratio. So this says the sharp ratios are limited. There's only so much sharp ratio you can find in any market. Now, so let's look at what does this equation imply. Here's the list of implications. First of all, there is a mean variance frontier, or a mean standard deviation frontier. Uh, you can plot mean versus variance or mean versus standard deviation. I've chosen standard deviation. This just tells us that all securities must lie in this green zone here. The, the, the ratio of their mean to standard deviation can be less, but it can't lie, lie outside there. And this, this part here is called the mean variance frontier. It's the frontier. It's the best possible ratio of mean to standard deviation you can get. How big is the slope of this frontier? What is the maximal sharp ratio of any security that you can get? Well, it's higher in an economy with more risk or more risk aversion, sensibly. The premiums you get for holding risk can be higher in an economy with, uh, in an economy with um, more risk or more risk aversion. All frontier returns, the returns on the frontier, are of course generated by rho equals 1. That means all frontier returns are perfectly correlated with the discount factor, and hence they are perfectly correlated with each other. So although these are different returns, they all move in lockstep because they all have rho equals 1. That means the very famous two-fund theorem. Uh, the returns on the mean variance frontier are not really separate objects. As soon as you have any single return on the mean variance frontier, then every other return on the mean variance frontier is just a scaled up version or a scaled down version of that one because they're all perfectly correlated with each other. We call it a two-fund theorem because if we look at the underlying returns, not excess returns, then there's the mean variance return and the risk-free rate. And so you need those two funds in order to generate any return on the mean variance frontier. That was historically very important when we thought people wanted to hold mean variance efficient returns because it means you only need two index funds. You don't need to hire people to charge uh, lots of fees to create different portfolios for you. Finally, the Roll theorem. The Roll theorem states that uh, there is a beta representation. So expected returns are proportional to the beta of returns using a mean variance efficient return, using RMV as a reference return, uh, that thing on the right hand side of our beta regressions, if and only if RMV is a return on the mean variance frontier. So if I find a return on the mean variance frontier, I have found an asset pricing model. I have found something that I can put on the right hand side, calculate betas, and all other returns uh, will, will uh, line up. Their expected returns will line up with their betas. And the proof is just, again, it's a, it's a consequence of correlations being one. If all the correlations are one, 
Uh, that means that this, this return is on the mean variance frontier. It's perfectly correlated with the discount factor, and therefore the discount factor and my mean variance are, uh, efficient return move in lockstep. So we started our search for asset pricing models, and this gives us an important insight. Any asset pricing model is the same as the statement that there is some return on the mean variance frontier. If Fama and French's asset pricing model is right, it means there's a combination of their value and small uh, portfolios that is on the mean variance frontier. Um, the capital asset pricing model is simply the statement that the market return is on the mean variance frontier. The market returns on the mean variance frontier if and only if expected returns line up with betas on the market times a factor risk premium. So that's a pretty remarkable set of theorems. Now, Let's look at what I haven't said, and that you might think I've said if you know a little too much about finance. I haven't said anything about returns being normally distributed. I haven't said anything about limiting the assets to stocks and not including bonds and options and derivatives and, and other things. I haven't said anything about utility functions, means, variances, quadratic utility, and so forth. <coughs> Why not? Because of the things I'm not saying. I have not said that the market return is on the mean variance frontier. That's a restriction. That's a capital asset pricing model. And I've not said that any investor wants to hold a return on the mean variance frontier. Typically, they don't. Our, our larger models, the market return and investors' returns will be inside the mean variance frontier. Investors want to smooth consumption growth. They don't want necessarily mean and variance. There's a host of special assumptions where the market and investors hold something on the mean variance frontier. But we haven't made those assumptions. The mean variance frontier has this historically very important place in asset pricing because it comes from our early special assumptions that put portfolios on the mean variance frontier and put the market on the mean variance frontier. And it had all those special assumptions in it. It survives, though. All of these pricing results survive. And means and variances are still important. Why? Because our fundamental asset pricing formulas involve second moments. So when you're doing first and second moments, mean and variance frontiers are still important. They still carry all the pricing information, even though it's not necessarily true that people want to hold mean variance efficient portfolios. <laughs>